everybody. Welcome back to another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. And this week's episode, we're talking about the new Reformation, the need for the new Reformation. And this is our fourth conversation in what will probably be uh, an extended ongoing uh, conversation until I think we realize, hey, uh, the Reformation's here. And, uh, and then we'll say, what do we do with it? But I think it's, it's something that's on the heart of Ken, and, uh, and I, it's on the heart of a lot of people uh, that, that the Lord is really wanting to do a new thing and wanting to maybe even bring us back to some old things that, uh, that we've lost And so as a church. And so we're here, Ken. It's just me and you here. We're taking a break from, uh, from our guest interviews that have been so great. Um, and we're talking through this idea of, of reformation. We've, we've talked through, you know, what is it, defining it? Um, why do we need it? Uh, what did the last one look like? And uh, we just had an interesting conversation uh, with, with a uh, premier uh, New Testament scholar that he said something that leads us into this, is that uh, this is the third great schism. And uh, of the church and what an interesting thing talking about first from east and west uh, orthodox then to uh, uh, protestant reformation and now here we are with uh, this reformation that's happening uh, the schism that's happening between um, i'm trying to figure out how nice i want to be people that believe the bible and people that don't <laughs> it's basically where i'm going kind of yeah <laughs> yeah and so and calling themselves christians and so um, you know, it's, it's been burning in your heart and I'm excited to, to get into it. So where, where are we going today in this, in this discussion of uh, the new reformation? Yeah. So we've been talking about, uh, principles of the new reformation and, uh, we kind of gave an overview and we've, we've covered a couple of key principles already for those who might've missed, uh, those other sessions. We talked about, um, strength in what is weak and is about to die. Uh, as the first kind of so that we had the intro and then the second part of this we talked about principle one uh, print strengthen what is weak and is about to die and then principle two we talked about the principle of um, uh, precept upon precept and line upon line here a little there a little and uh, and now this week uh, as we're talking about this I want to talk about this third principle and it comes out of Isaiah chapter 40. The Lord spoke to me out of this verse a couple of years ago, and I didn't really understand what all it meant. And at one point I was on Eric Metaxas's uh, broadcast and he asked me, you know, what's one of your emphases that you're, you know, that you're after right now? And I started to talk about this uh, because it was very fresh in my mind and it, it, it has really remained fresh with me. Uh, but it comes out of Isaiah 40, verse 9, and it says this, go up to a high mountain, or uh, I think in King James it says, get thee up on a high mountain, uh, O Zion, herald of good news, lift your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news, lift it up, fear not, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. And, you know, just as I'm reading this, I'm, I'm kind of choking up uh, with the verse because I don't, I, I, there's just so much power in this passage. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's right after the beginning of the second part of Isaiah's ministry. Uh, some scholars say that there's a second Isaiah. It wasn't really Isaiah that wrote it all. But when I look at Isaiah's life, I see him functioning prophetically in chapters one to five of the book of Isaiah. And then he gets his first calling which occurs in the temple in chapter six of Isaiah. It's the one that says in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And, and he'd gone into the temple apparently to pray and worship. He has this transcendent vision of God. And he says the train of his robe filled the temple. And the Lord said to me, or the, the angels were flying saying, holy, holy, holy. And, uh, and the Lord said, who will go for us? Who, whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, here I am, Lord, send me. And so then the angel comes and purges his lips and gives him a message. And it becomes the first part of Isaiah's ministry message, which is, um, is cry out this message, all flesh is grass. 
and all of their uh, beauty is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And so that that's really becomes the kind of baseline of Isaiah's ministry. And in that, um, Isaiah has a number of words uh, that it, they, they're definitely not happy God kinds of words. They are words against major cities and nations of his time. Uh, the thoughts of God about how they have departed from righteousness. And it's interesting that in those passages, God is really calling them to account for a departure from his ways of righteousness, even though these other cities and nations are not themselves Jewish. So you could say, how would they have any knowledge of God and his ways and his law? And yet God expects that the revelation he's given of himself in, in nature and in history uh, should be enough to, to call people to account. But, you know, we finish up with Isaiah 39, and, it, and it's kind of a poignant end, really, because this, this is the end of Assyria and their attempt to assail Judah and to assail Jerusalem in the aftermath of the fall of the northern kingdom that at this point is now known as the kingdom of Israel. And all that remains of, of the Jews is the southern kingdom of Judah, which also includes Benjamin. And so in Isaiah uh, 40, the, the word of the Lord now comes to Isaiah in chapter 40 with a, with a completely different emphasis. And, you know, a lot of people are like, I don't, I don't know how to relate to this complete change of emphasis, but it's because Isaiah has fulfilled the mission that God has given him. And so now, and by the way, he, he also brings words of correction and rebuke to the Jewish people. He doesn't simply focus on the other nations. But now in Isaiah 40, he's transitioning. And now the word of the Lord redirects Isaiah instead of words of correction and saying all flesh is grass and all the all of its glory is like the flowers of the field, the grass withers, the flower fades. The word of our God will stand forever. So you, O sons of men, O you, O daughters of, of, of uh, women, you know, you, you, despite the glory that you have, despite the greatness of what you build, despite your intellectual achievements, despite your building of cities and nations and empires, all of that's going to fade. But now in chapter 40, we transition and the word of the Lord is no longer that way. It's rather comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly unto Jerusalem and say unto her, that your years of warfare are ended and her iniquity is pardoned. And so with this, now God is speaking to Isaiah in verse 9 of chapter 40. And Isaiah, I want you to get up on a high mountain. Well, the reason presumably you would go up on a high mountain is if you shout from a mountaintop, your voice resonates into the valleys. It, it spreads, you know, a human voice in the wilderness, if you've ever been out in the mountains, somebody can be literally more than a mile away, and they can be talking in a normal conversational tone. And you can often hear that voice coming to you over the trees or across the meadows, whatever it is. And so it's go up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. This is the good news now. It's no longer the chastisement or rebuking news and lift up your voice with strength. Well, if you've got a strong voice, that means it's clear, it's distinct, uh, you may be shouting, um, but, you know, at a minimum, you're cupping your hands over your mouth and you're, you're speaking with a, with a kind of urgency and a, a firmness of, of diction, right? And so we're going to speak with voice, and it's not just Zion, it's, it's Jerusalem. You're the herald, you're the bearer of good news, and lift up and do not be afraid, fear not. So don't, don't hold back, is what God is saying to Isaiah and he says, and say to the cities of Judah, because, of course, the cities of Israel have been destroyed at this point. Say to the cities of Judah, behold, your God, this is who your God is. And so this, I think, is our, is our third major principle of the Reformation is that um, God is saying to us that we as the church have to show, not tell. I think for a long time, we have told stories maybe about God. We've talked often in, you know, great theological language about, well, good theology and what does God, what does God want and, and all of that. And certainly I, I believe in doing that. 
But I think um, I think oftentimes we've we've done a lot of talking and not a lot of doing. And John Wimber used to say when he was alive that Jesus was a word worker. What he did, he taught, and what he taught, he did. And so I think where we're coming to is the place where, again, we must have an evidentiary faith. It must be a faith based on evidence that people can see and interact with. And, and this could have all kinds of angles to it. In Jesus's ministry, healing is the thing that we hear about the most, but deliverance is right beside it. And there are miracles, right? He walks on water, he turns water into wine, he rebukes the wind and the waves, um, they need money for taxes. So Jesus says to Peter, go catch a fish. And when you do, pull the, money, pull the coin out of its mouth. Well, how would you even know to do that? I mean, what, what kind of a thing is that? But these are all signs of evidence that God is really in our midst, that this is more than just the latest idea or it's your, your word against mine. Mm. So as we talk about this principle of the Reformation, I think there are, uh, <clears throat> I think there's probably three things we want to say. The first one is that the miraculous gospel has a place in the world because people are looking for spiritual truth. Now, when we were with Dr. Watson, you know, he, he, he talked about this and how, uh, at least in the writings of, of an early 20th century theologian named Rudolf Bultmann, who was a, who was a giant intellectually, I'm, I'm not sure what he was spiritually, but he was a giant intellectually. And Rudolf Bultmann said, we must demythologize the gospel. We have to take out those things that are no longer consistent with the modern world because at least in the early 20th century, I don't think too many people were thinking about supernatural Christianity unless they were probably at Azusa Street or, or something coming out of it. But within the wider body of Christendom, I don't think anybody was thinking about this. And it's because our worldview was largely still uh, enlightenment worldview. And so there was a, there was a demythologizing, a de-supernaturalization uh, the prominent uh, paradigm, predominant paradigm of God himself at that time was what we call deism, the belief that uh, God had wound up the universe and let it run down, but he didn't really intervene in the affairs of mankind very much at that point. That was the paradigm that Boltmann was speaking to. But I think in our time, and we can see it left and right, we see people chasing supernatural experiences within the Christian community. We have a, a, the rise of the new mystics and not all of this is orthodox, but it, but it is mystical. And so right. people are trying to have contact with God. They may be doing other things. They may be going after Eastern mysticism, or they may be, uh, you know, they may be on the Carlos Castaneda track or they're, you know, they're using drugs as, you know, part of their religious experience. And just now I'm thinking of, uh, of course, I can't think of the word. Uh, but, you know, people are talking about Ayurveda if they're in the East. Uh, there's another word. Um, I can't think of it. But yeah, I know, it, I know that there's something people are doing with uh, with certain experimental drugs in order to have like a spiritual awakening. That's uh, right. With some chemicals. Yeah. That and, seems and I, I, I know the word. I've used it a lot. I've ministered to people who are in it and just I'm having a senior moment, I guess. But Anyway, uh, but, but people are chasing kind of an Indian, and I don't mean uh, East Indian, I mean like, you know, Central American Indian type spirituality that's rooted in all of that, and thus the name Carlos Castaneda, but there are many others. So people are going after all that, but I think what they're really looking for is some kind of a spiritual experience, whether it's a vision, whether it's a transportation, whether it's a, a healing, it's something and so this idea of say to the cities of Judah, this is your God, it's not just let me tell you about him, it's let me show him to you. And so we have to be putting God on display. Now that's true evangelistically, but it's true within the walls of the church. It's true within the academy. We've got to bring the, the reality that this is more than just a mind game. I think this is something that Christianity has largely fallen into is the idea that it's, it's mostly... Uh, your word against mine. And so while, yeah, it's nice that you've got some consistent worldview that comes out of your Christianity, you don't, you don't actually ever show me anything. You just sort of argue your way to it. And I would say much of the classic apologist kind of work that we've seen in the 20th and 21st century is very much in this vein. I, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus by naming names because I'm not 
trying to call anybody out, but I can say that in the 80s and the 90s, I was reading a lot of apologetic works and, and you can find these people online by their books and they do a very good job of articulating rationally why Christianity is, is the right answer. But a lot of times that isn't enough for people. They're like, yeah, well, but if I talk to somebody who's a Muslim scholar or a Hindu scholar, they have their own thought system. What makes yours real? And it's this, it's this uh, interaction with the miraculous that makes it real. So if I'm sick, I get healed. If I need guidance, I get it. And it comes to pass. If I happen to see an angel, that's a bonus. But, but people want that kind of uh, miraculous gospel because they are looking for spiritual truth. So this is our first kind of sub principle of this Isaiah 40 verse nine. No, I, I agree. And I think it's so important uh, to think through because, and this, this is, you know, one of the things that came up uh, a little while ago is that, you know, with the state of the church, I think a lot of people are wanting to know uh, the, so what, you know, so you believe all of these things. Uh, they're not seeing a lot of fruit and we boiled it down to, Maybe we're, we're a little bit nicer, but that's even very questionable <laughs> amongst uh, Christians and our reputation. Uh, we don't have a great reputation. And, and so the, the question, I think, is why should they? You know? And I think it is this, uh, I think they need to see something of, of, a, of, of the workings of God. I think they need to understand that we're, we're not adhering to some sort of, um, you know, best life principle. Uh, or self-help principle to do a little bit better, but this is something that I mean we're, we're under the authority of the living God, and and look at what happens. Um, it can't all be about that, but I think it hasn't been for so long, and I think that there is there's a longing in people's hearts for something more. I mean that that's really you know if you want to be an evangelist right now, uh, people don't really believe in hell, and so trying to convince them they're going to hell uh, is, is a hard, long road uh, to, uh, to, to winning, winning souls. But if you start to talk about, there's a, there's a longing uh, really for the garden. There's a longing for, uh, for the original creation uh, that that's, it's, it's in display in art and in movies. And it's, everybody wants to be found as, as that, you know, I always say like Harry Potter living under the stairs discovered that you're meant for something more and that there's something more to life, you know, and that's, I th so I think you're right. And I think we've got to do a better job of explaining that and showing that for sure. You know, David said in the Psalms that God pulled me out of the miry clay. And, and I think there is this idea that we, we could do well to revisit, namely that God is launching a rescue operation. Uh, you know, you can think of, I don't know, the, the captives in Iran during the days of the Iranian takeover of the U.S. embassy, or you could think of some school teacher in the highlands of, I don't know, Afghanistan, and the Taliban captures him or her. And so the Navy SEALs or the Delta Force go in there and they, you know, they get this person out of there. I think, I think people on some level are really looking for a rescue. They are looking for God to undertake on their behalf, because even though nobody wants to admit it because of human pride, you know, we think we've got everything under control. The fact of the matter is we are hopelessly lost. We are, we are in trouble. You know, lost is an older fashioned term we used to use. It implies we don't know our way out of the woods. And, and I think that's true, but it may not sit well with the idea of, of modern mankind. It may not sit with our, with our sentiments. But if we understand that, man, we're in a mess. I mean, look at our country right now. Look at America. Look at, look at the racial tensions. Look at the economy, uh, the printing of money. Look at how we're trying to pull ourselves out of this thing called COVID. And we've got a lot of problems. And, you know, part of this Isaiah 40 verse 9 thing is that God has answers to your problems. It may be as simple as your kid's head cold, or it may be way more complex and societal, but God has an answer. And if we, will, if we will find that answer ourselves and then implement it, and it, it may be as simple as we lay hands on people like they did when the disciples were sent out, or it may be much more structural, uh, implementing new institutions and, and um, worldview within a society. I mean, some, you know, HIM, the Harvest International Ministries Network led by Cheon, they are all about 
uh, trying to bring reformation to society and, you know, speaking into these things of government and business and so on. I mean, that's, that's kind of how they view their own wheelhouse. So it, it could be much smaller and micro and just, you know, what do you do with your neighbor? It could be something kind of bigger. What do I do on my city block or my street? Or what do I do in my company where I work? It could be very big. How, how are we going to change a nation? But however we do it, um, we're engaged with that process. I think, I think that's a critical part of it because we're putting on display that God has launched a rescue operation. He's got something for humanity. And so, you know, say to the cities of Judah, and, and we might just kind of let's, let's update that. Not that I'm denying the inspiration of, of that passage, but don't just say to the cities of Judah, say to the cities of America, say to Los Angeles and San Francisco and Portland and Seattle and Coeur d'Alene and Boise and Gillette, Wyoming and Denver, Colorado, say to Bismarck and Minot, North Dakota, say to Minneapolis where George Floyd was killed, say to Chicago, say to New York City, say to Washington and Dallas and Houston and Atlanta and Nashville. And, you know, if I left your city out, I'm not meaning to omit anyone. I'm just trying to be, you know, that way. But say to those cities, look, this is your God. This is who he is. This is what he wants to do and bring it to pass, put it on exhibit. I think that's a very critical part of what we are called to do in this time. And it implies beyond teaching and preaching as important as those things are. We can't do it without, because Paul says, how will they ever believe if there is no preacher? And how will there be a preacher unless the preacher is sent? So that's critical, but it's beyond that. Show me, don't just tell me. I mean, I think this is what Jesus did, right? I mean, he would say, hey, the kingdom of God is at hand. Right. And then he would demonstrate what the kingdom of God looks like by leopards being cleansed, and by, uh, by the blind seeing, by like, this is what the kingdom of God looks like, by, by hungry being fed, you know? And so um, I, I think that's embodied in, in his whole ministry is, is, you know, look what happens when God's rule and reign comes to town. And, exactly. Yeah, I think it's I think it's so important. I, I, we need to hear this, Ken. I, I appreciate you doing that. So the second part of this, we've already kind of touched on it, but we have to rebuild confidence in the Lord and in his, not only his ability, but his willingness to engage on behalf of mankind. Hmm. And so, or humankind, I guess, to be more inclusive. But, uh, but you know, in our time, I think there's a there's a deep, it's almost a new form of agnosticism. And I'm just pausing to let that sink in. I mean, we all know what agnosticism is. It's the belief that if there is a God, we can't really know anything about him. He's, he's the unknowable God. A agnostic comes from the word agnosis or lack of knowledge, lack of knowing. And so, you know, and there's, and of course there's atheism as well. There is no God. Um, but, but there's kind of a new agnosticism. And I would say, I see this malaise on many Christians. Even sometimes, you know, spirit-filled, charismatic Christians, yeah. where they struggle to believe, does God really want to heal me? And, and more importantly, will God heal me? Mm -hmm. And especially if they've had whatever their condition is for years and they've not seen breakthrough. And, you know, one of the things people are drawn to, I think, with what we're doing through Orbis is we see a lot of breakthroughs that are very visible and tangible. But, you know, part of our message, I, I wouldn't say it's right in, well, it's, it's in the center of it, but it's not the center. But part of our message is this understanding that um, God not only want, wants to or is capable of, he's going to. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think a lot of people carry that in their hearts. And, and if you move to the fringes of the church, you move to people who are more, I mean, truly agnostic believers. They might profess Christianity. They might like the morals and ethics um, but, but they're not really all in on Christianity because they, 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 they don't really know much about God and his character. And there's a lot of dim dimensions to that, too. Just how do we live our own lives ethically? But the side I'm fo focusing on right now is not how do we live, but it's more what is God intending to do? What, what's he going to do on our behalf? People that come out of liberal Christian traditions, they, they just don't have any real confidence that God is this way. And I think part of what really takes people aback is when we walk in and we confidently say, of course, God's going to do this. And they're like, what? And then God actually does something. And then they're like, whoa, wait a minute, where did that come from? 
That, that is nothing like the conception of God that I was either raised in in Sunday school, that my pastor preaches, or that I've come to believe because I've heard so much bad news that there is no good news, right? And the scripture says right there in Isaiah 40, verse 9, that Zion and Jerusalem, we are to be heralds, you know, town criers, behold the good news. And the good news is God has come to the rescue. He's He's coming to earth. He's breaking in. And this is actually, I think, a critical part of why Jesus's ministry is called the evangel or the euangelion. It's called the good news. It, it comes from Roman military language, but it's also rooted deeply in biblical revelation right here in Isaiah 40. Jesus said, I come to proclaim the good news in the year of the Lord's favor. God, God's going to God's going to get off his throne and show you compassion. That's out of Isaiah chapter 30. That's what's on. That's what's going on right now. And, and, but see, we, as the heralds, we've got to have confidence that if we proclaim it, God will back it. I, I, that's so important. And, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned the liberal church, but I mean, you see it, I felt it, you know, in my own life where, you know, you're believing for something and the breakthrough doesn't happen. And I, I think we've even done a podcast on this. Mm -hmm. uh, priorly about you know how do you continue to expect you know and, and having an increasing expectation and so it's not just I wouldn't I, I think it, it it's everybody right I mean we're we're constantly um, sort of preparing ourselves to be disappointed and uh, and I think I think just you know that's that's the deal right you, we have to have a metanoia we have to change the way that we think and just start to expect uh, that God will back his word will will back the proclaimed word of him and instead of thinking oh i hope this happens or this may not happen i mean jesus puts a lot of emphasis so much so that it makes i, I think a lot of people uncomfortable on the importance of faith and and the importance of faith in in regards to the, the miraculous and uh and so i think you're right i think we have to have a confidence uh, before we move on, like ha, ha, real quick, how can we grow in our in our confidence in our faith? I am so glad you asked that. <laughs> so there are there are some key things we can do. Number one, if we will immerse ourselves in Scripture, and of course, in our last session on this topic, because this is a multi part series, we talked about this precept upon precept, line upon line dynamic. If we immerse ourselves in scripture, I think one of the most important functions that scripture has is to birth faith in our hearts because we dwell upon the things God has done in times gone by and we say, well, why not do it again? Yeah. And in fact, the psalmist even says this and so does Habakkuk in chapter three, verse two, Lord, we've heard of your fame. We stand in awe of your deeds. Renew in our day, in our time, the things that we heard of in times gone by. And we see that same question, by the way, in coming out of the mouth of none other than Gideon. When the angel of the Lord calls Gideon in Judges chapter six, he says to him, hail, mighty man of valor, you know, and Gideon's like, who are you talking to, right? right. But, but it is in fact him. And, and part of why Gideon is selected actually spills out of his mouth, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, uh, when the angel summons him and, and Gideon goes, well, you know, I got a question for you, Mr. Angel. If it's really true that uh, that the Lord is God over Israel, where are all these great deeds that we heard about that are written in our, you know, the scripture wasn't as thick then. It was only, you know, Genesis through uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy plus the book of Joshua. Because right at that point, we're in the book of Judges, which is the seventh book in the Bible. So we've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua. That's all we got. But Gideon has been There's thinking about of, this. Why is that? There's a lot of miraculous in there. In There's the a lot. Yeah. I mean, we got the whole Red Sea. We got 10 plagues. You know, we got, we got a lot of things. We got, you know, Sarah gets pregnant. There's a ton of stuff in there. So we're looking at it. And it's clear that Gideon has been thinking about this. And so when the angel comes to him, he goes, I got a question for you. Where are those deeds? And that is actually not a skeptical question as much as it's a question that says, I believe the written word of God and what was you know, deemed worthy to be get grop tie back to what we were talking about with Dr. Watson. But I don't see it. How come? 
And so if we will kind of engage with God at that level, I think there's something about that that attracts him. It's almost like, all right, there's somebody who's actually thinking about things. And, and we see just a little, just a snippet of this in Malachi. It's, it's much later book, but, but the Lord says, you know, test me in this and see if, if, I, if you tithe, if I will not open the windows of heaven mm-hmm. and pour out on you an abundance that you can't even contain. Just try it. Most people won't try it, so they never experience it. So they say it doesn't work, and then God's a theory. But we, what's this podcast called? God is not a theory. Yeah. And so it's really in that engagement with Scripture that is designed to provoke us. Now, the second thing we can do that will help us get there is um, we can listen to testimony, but even more, engage with people who live that kind of a lifestyle, who see these things going on because they will have a living witness and they can tell you, oh yeah, this is how God does it. This is why he does it. I see this all the time, blah, 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 blah. And after a while people go, what are you talking about? I mean, I have this all the time. When I talk to people I used to work with in corporate or some of my classmates that I knew at Princeton, um, even if they're believers and, and I mean, you know, people who believe the Bible, they've never really thought about the Bible as this is how it ought to look. It's more, this is what you ought to believe. So it's more in the head rather than in the life. Yeah. I mean, it, it has impact on the life, but the life that we're talking about there is nearly always ethical. You know, you don't cheat, you don't lie, you don't commit adultery. Those are good things not to do. But they never really think about this is this is what the contours of your life, the shape of your life ought to be like. So I often have people like that say to me, you know, Ken, I don't, I don't know anybody who talks about God who tells stories of God the way you do, you have a very strange life. And, and you've heard me say to you, I have a very strange life because most people just don't live that way. But if you get around people that are living that kind of thing, it, there's something about it that kind of draws you to it. And, and I think, honestly, this is one of the things that makes Bethel so attractive to people. It's one of the things that makes Randy Clark so attractive to people. Back in the day of Toronto, when they were at their heyday, I mean, they're still going on, but when they were really at their peak, this is what drew people to Toronto. This is what drew people to the vineyard. And so um, people people really want that, and they want to have that confidence in God and in his ability. And if if we will go that way, God will back it up. So again, what does what does I what's Isaiah's charge? Well, get up on a high mountain. So don't don't hide your a city on a hill cannot be hid, right? Don't put your light under a bushel. Um, and you are a herald of good news. You are a proclaimer of good news. You're we could say you're a good newser. You're to go out and be talking about all this good news everywhere you go. Lift up your voice with strength. Be firm and certain about what you say. Lift it up and do not fear and say to the cities of Judah, to the cities of America, to the cities of Europe, to the cities of Asia, to the cities of Australia, to the cities of South America, to the cities of Africa. I think I've named all the inhabited continents there. Say to every last one of them, this is who God is. That is what we're supposed to be doing with that confidence. And if we will do that, I'm telling you, God will back the act. I've seen him do it over and over and over again. Just a simple little story. Um, we're broadcasting this or recording this, I guess, on a Thursday. And uh, four days ago, I was preaching at a church in uh, the Baltimore area. And it was Pentecost Sunday. And the pastor had asked me to talk about something having to do with Pentecost. So I talked about Pentecost in the kingdom. And it was kind of a nerdy, poindexterous sort of a sermon, some theological language. But then we got down to the end of it. And I, I wanted to make it really applicable. And I said, How many people here have never gotten the gift of tongues? You may have asked for it before, but you've never, ever spoken in tongues. Today's Pentecost, you'd like to get filled with the Spirit and speak in tongues. Nine hands went up. wasn't an overly large service, but I don't know. We might have had 70 or 80 people there, but nine hands went up. And I I don't know. Maybe there were some that were just chicken. I'm not sure. But anyway, I said, all right, all of you come up here. So they came up. We prayed for them. Nine out of nine got, got filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. Well, that's evidentiary Christianity. I mean, we put God on display. And I even said, now this is a little risky because if you've had prayer before, you probably are kind of stuck on, I'm never going to get the gift of tongues. 
but but I believe me, God's going to do something here. And they didn't all get it at once, by the way. We had several that got it pretty quickly. We kept praying, kept praying, and eventually we were down to eight out of nine. And as more another one would get it, I would say over the microphone, okay, there's another one. So now we're up to this number. But finally, it was nine out of nine. I'll tell you what, that got people's attention. And you know what they realized? God is not a theory. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, being with you and, uh, and learning, I mean, you know, I think so much of what, what happens is that we, we stop short and, um, and, you know, your, your, your question with Gideon and, and, and him questioning, I've seen you do that. And when we're praying for people, you know, when it's, when the healing hasn't come or the deliverance hasn't come, you typically say, okay, what Lord, where's it at? What's going yeah. on? Instead of yeah. like, oh, well, you know, we'll get it next time. And, you know, I think, I think it's just that's, that's staying with it and just continuing to, I mean, what is it? Contend for the faith and, and continuing to, to press in on that. I think that's, that's such an important, crucial piece of this and, and to have, have that confidence. And you know what, you know why you saw nine out of nine is because you actually stepped out and, and took this giant risk Right. And you could have looked really stupid and you, but you didn't care. And, and it, when I talk to people, that's the thing that keeps them from experiencing testimonies from having their own testimonies is that you're going to have to put yourself out there to, for him to back. It means you get, you get a step off into the abyss, you know, I mean, that kind of like Peter getting out of the boat, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. So I, I think people want testimonies and it's like, okay, go get it. I mean, it's out there. But you're gonna have to you're gonna have to get uncomfortable. That's right. Yeah. So the third part of this verse is say unto the cities of Judah. So the third part of this is we have to become focused on cities. And you know, when John Wimber was alive, he would sometimes say, Jesus did not die for clean air and green trees. I mean, we'd all love to live in, I don't know, whatever, Whitefish, Montana or you know, Estes National Park, you know, in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, or, you know, pick your favorite place. I don't care. You maybe you want to live at the beach, not in the mountains. But, you know, on the one hand, we'd all love to be there. But the fact is, that's not where the people are. And we got to go to the people. And so Jesus went through all the towns and villages as he was preaching, because that's where the people were. Yeah, you could have come to some little hamlet where there'd be, I don't know, a family of whatever they were, maybe eight or 10 in those days living and working the farm and, and, and maybe he passed through some of those places and and did a little bit of ministry in such a place on his way to wherever he was going but mostly jesus was you know he even went to the big cities such as they were we think specifically of jerusalem we think of him coming to the decapolis um so jesus was about that but the, the command that the lord gave isaiah was you are to speak to the cities and so with that, we have to develop strategies that address the needs of our cities. And, and I'm not talking about new social programs. I think in general, um, government does social programs better than the church. They're better funded for sure. Uh, they may not have the human touch and, and we can do the human touch thing and the God touch thing a lot better than the government can. But a lot of times the church is not that well organized. A lot of times the church is... Uh, well, we're kind of lame, actually, because we've got a volunteer workforce. And so we don't have people who are being paid to execute. And so with that, we don't always get things done. So um, I don't I don't have a problem with it if we want to take that on with whatever, with whatever feeding programs or, you know, initiating dialogue between various groups. But we're certainly going to have to up our game on the execution side if we're going to play in that in that league. Because otherwise, we'll just get left behind as uh, they tried, but they did a lame job, and, and so never mind them. Right. But I think the bigger question is, how do we evangelize cities? How do we reach people who live in the, uh, the anonymity of cities, who live in the busyness and frenzy of cities, who live in the worldliness and the culture that cities engender? How do we live in uh, cities where... People are displaced from family and friends. They're maybe forming new friendship circles, but, but the things that traditionally would have held them maybe in their youth, wherever they came from, uh, a lot of times that's upended when people go to the city. How do, we, how do we speak to people who are caught up with the glitz and glamour of cities? How do we do that? You know, we've, we've got to figure out ways that are authentic to the true gospel 
uh, and, and that are evidentiary, that have that supernatural component, and that will yet penetrate the, the fabric, the, the social matrix of a city in a way that whole social networks get invaded and we can see mass people movements occur in the cities. Paul clearly did this in his ministry. He ministered in Philippi. He went to Thessalonica. Uh, he started a revival in Thessalonica that went all the way up into the Balkans. And there would have been cities there. But, you know, it's interesting. Paul had nodes for his ministry that mostly were not rural. They were mostly urban. And, you know, he goes to Berea. He goes to Athens. He goes to Corinth. And later he goes to Ephesus, which was a very prominent city late in his life. And ultimately he goes to Rome where he dies. And so we see this emphasis there. And I think we've got to become a lot smarter about how to preach the authentic gospel into city context and stop running away from the city because it's worldly or it might corrupt me or my family. And we've got to become much more resilient in the gospel that we preach and teach and much more robust so that we can face the challenges of cities. I think there's there's a lot of work being done in this area and some of it's more valuable than others, but however that gets played out, I think this is the summons that God has upon us. Well, and you know, it makes me think about the thing you, you and I have talked about multiple times, I think offline, but you know, we see the, we see the pattern of Paul and, and the difference between how he engages at Mars Hill versus how he engages in Corinth. And, and there is a difference. And it, it goes back to what you were saying in the very beginning about putting God on display. You know, he, he, he tries to be as relevant as possible in Mars Hill. And, and it says at the end, uh, a few, a couple yep. you know, believed. That's right. And he goes to Corinth and he shakes it off and he goes, okay, I've decided to preach nothing but the power of the gospel. And it explodes. And I know, you know, we're an inner city church accidentally uh, <laughs> never never meant to be but that's where we're at and uh and and i'll tell you what i've seen some incredible things because it's it's where the people are there's enough people that are you know jesus says he came for the sick not the healthy and there's a lot of people in the cities that know that they're sick you know we're all sin sick but but you know folks in the suburbs a lot of times they've got a lot of toys to distract them Yes, and, they do. and folks in the cities, they know they're sick. And so there's something about that. There's something about that supernatural component that Paul brings into the place that you would think the best thing to do would be to be relevant to these intellectual elites. But instead, he brings this supernatural component and it breaks it breaks it right open. And I That's think exactly right. And I think it goes right back to what you were saying. It's it's us continuing to expect God to move. You know, there was a there was a book that came out. I, I can't remember now. It might have been ten or fifteen years ago by a man named Ramsey, and it's just simply called Evangelizing Rome. And he did this, you know, big study of what were the factors that led ultimately to the conversion of Rome. Now it took a you know it took a few hundred years, but but they did get it done, um, so that Rome became a Christian empire. And so he's looking at that, and after examining all the data. What he, what he comes down to is he says, the thing that ultimately led to the conversion of Rome was, well, in this case, healing, but it was, again, a supernatural thing, putting God on display, um, because there, were, there was no first, second, or third tier city where you didn't have a Christian presence. And, you know, he looked at some extra biblical sources, not only the Bible, and he concluded that when Paul was done with his outreach in Turkey in the Ephesian campaign, there were no sick people left in Turkey. They'd pretty much all been touched by God's power. And, he, you know, the thing that's interesting is uh, Luke notes in Acts 19 in one of the, it, it's not right in the center of the text. You need a Bible that gives you the footnotes and some of the alternate readings and things of the many thousands of manuscripts of the New Testament that we have. But there's one very strong manuscript tradition that says Paul was busy preaching and teaching in Ephesus from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. every day. Now, this is, of course, in a time when there's no high-speed rail links or superhighways or planes or anything like that. So if that's where you are from 11 to 4 every day, 
You might do some night meetings uh, if you are have any energy left, but you sure aren't traveling from Ephesus, say back to Galatia or out to Colossae to do a meeting here or there because you've got to be back the next morning and you can't, you just can't travel that far. You're either walking or riding a horse. And even if you're at a full gallop, you won't make it out and back. So how did Paul do it? Well, he trained the disciples to be the ones to put God on display. And they did, they were busy fulfilling the Isaiah 40 verse nine mandate. It's in a new Testament context. So the language is slightly different, but the concept is identical. And so, you know, again, what do we call this podcast? What do I call my group on Facebook? God is not a theory. This is not some hypothetical theoretical thing that we're talking about. We want to bring people into an actual real live understanding of who God is and have him become so integrally involved in their lives that day by day, and, and, or at least week by week, God is doing something. And, and this is what we see in the life of the early church. They were The Lord continued to work miracles in their midst. And as a result, the Lord was adding to their number day by day, those who were being saved. There was so much of that activity, even if it wasn't with Grant today, it was with Ken tomorrow, right? It was that kind of a, you know, but, but collectively, we, the people of God, are putting God on display. We are going up to our own high mountains. And what are the high mountains in today's world? Well, they tend to be things like social media channels. If we can get on the mainstream media, they're there. Uh, whether it's YouTube or, or just your tweets, or you know, it may, be, it, may, it may be what you do with your friends and neighbors, but where, wherever your mountain is, you get up on it and you say confidently, this is my God, and this is to be your God too. Yeah, yeah, and I've heard, I've heard someone say, you know, in regards to your mountain or where, where that place is, it's, it's where the Lord has given you a measure of rule. Right. It's where you have some sort of level of authority or some, some relationship that that's there, you know, and, uh, and, and so it's, it's not only on, you know, large platforms or whatever, but it could be, like you said, in your neighborhood, or in your office. Um, it's got, it's gotta be everywhere. It's gotta permeate everything. That's right. So, um, this is this is really, I, I guess, a good place to, you know, land this podcast. Uh, it, it's that Isaiah forty verse nine mandate: get up on a high mountain, you know, make this proclamation of good news. Say to the cities of Judah, and and do so. Do this everywhere. This is your God, and and with it, we we, whether we do it by invitation or cajoling or wheedling or summons. We, we invite people to get reacquainted with this God. You know, you made a comment, I don't know, 20 minutes ago about this idea of repentance. And, and I've often said repentance is more than just saying, God, I'm sorry for my sins. It is that. But it's also the idea of changing your mind, changing your mindset about God, coming into that understanding. Oh, yeah, this is the God we serve. Oh, wow. Look at what God can do. Look at what God will do. Look at what God did do. And as we kind of move kind of in that direction, uh, we ourselves have our mindset changed, and so do those with whom we interact. And, and that's part of how we catalyze a revival. I like that. That's exciting. Well, I think as we're, as we're closing this one, um, I, we're trying to find the right words because uh, a lot of people will ask for an impartation and, and assume that uh, that means that they don't have to do anything. Um, I don't want to give that, that thought, but I don't know very many more people personally that put God on display and put their neck on the line as much as you do. And, uh, if we could all borrow just a little bit of your faith, uh, I think, I think we would, we would be doing good. And so I was wondering, can you pray for us, uh, that the, you know, it's what the disciples would give us boldness, stretch out your finger and give us boldness. And, and I think if I were to sum you up, uh, there's a boldness for the gospel um, that, that over, overshadows the rest of your life. And so uh, if, if you could pray for us, and that doesn't mean that you're going to just all of a sudden be bold and, and then you don't have to do anything. You do have to put this stuff to practice. And so we don't want to pretend like this is a magic, uh, magic formula to seeing all the miracles it can see while we still sit in our living rooms and you know, play video games all the time. So, but, but I do think it's important for you to pray for us and pray over us that we could something in, ignite in us. To sure. Make I'd be glad to do that. All right. 
Yeah. So Father, I just thank you for uh, the opportunity that we have through this platform, this podcast, that, that we can speak to many more people than maybe we would otherwise be able to do. And I thank you for the, the thousands of people that are listening to this broadcast. And even now we just come together in a moment of prayer and we come in Jesus name because he told us that if we would gather in his name, anytime there's two or more, he is there in our midst. And so Lord, we're, we're together virtually. We're not together physically, but nevertheless, we, we really count this principle as being the right one that Jesus is in our midst. And with that, Father, I just come to you in confidence that you would pour out your spirit upon us. We've just passed Pentecost Sunday. And I come to you in confidence asking for an outpouring of your spirit. And just as happened in the book of Acts, where in addition to speaking in tongues and prophesying, it says they spoke the word of God boldly. This was one of the signs that came because of Holy Spirit infilling. I pray for a confidence and a boldness to come upon everyone who's watching this podcast or listening to it, that they would receive from you, that their hearts would be inflamed with boldness and passion, that they would speak with confidence, and that your, your spirit would be on their very lips and upon their tongues, and that they would speak words that are wise, words that are anointed. Father, Jesus told us that if we were ever put on exhibit before uh, kings and governors, that the very thing we needed would be given to us in the moment, in that, in that hour. And I pray that you would do that for every person who listens to this and wants to reach out and grab it. And with it, Lord, that you would begin raising up a people who can declare authentically who God is, show authentically who God is by putting you on display, and out of that, be part of the catalyst the fuel that accelerates and drives the revival that we speak of. Father, let these things happen. Let them happen quickly. Let them be so completely in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ken, thank you so much. Uh, I love talking about this. I know people love listening to this, and so I look forward to continued conversations uh, about this uh, in, in the days ahead. So uh, until then, we thank you guys for tuning in, and uh, we want to we want to invite you to visit uh, the website uh, orbisministries.com or dot org orbisministries.org, and uh, you'll be able to find uh, all of his resources there. Until then, we will see you next week.